You're listening to Brainwork Framework, a business and marketing podcast brought to you by focus-biz.com. Business owners and entrepreneurs, does it ever feel like you're not prioritizing your self-care? Maybe your health is going down and you're not sure how to take back your own life? Well, with us today is a certified life coach and health coach with Kizan Mindset Creators, or KMC for short. Jesse Ruiz, thanks so much for joining us today. How are you? Pretty good. Thank you, Chris, for inviting me. Absolutely. So I'd love to talk more about your entrepreneurial journey. What were you doing before and how did that lead you into uh, creating this group of um, certified life coaches and, and health coaches? Well, my journey started when I turned age 27, when I went to an acting class of all places. That's where I met my mentor, who led me to really understand the importance of education as well as one's improvement. And later on, I learned a lot more from my, as I would say, elders to show more respect to my professors, the retired salarymen who practice Kings of King is one of the elder, well, I would say not ancient style of meditation or programming. It's similar to coaching, but counseling. It's a progression of one's self to improve one's self. That's why it's in the title of my business. It helps a lot of people understand and it helps people grasp what the company provides. And mindset creators, I work with your typical different types of background. I don't work with one set background, but my journey is I have a blue collar background. I worked at a university as an independent tutor. I worked in the build of on the spectrum or non the spectrum children, as well as people who are undiagnosed. It just helps me understand and grasp with people. I don't try to force certain things down anyone's like, I would say capabilities. I try to work with their capabilities so that way they can grow and become a faster and better person. To simplify it, I don't try to like overcomplicate it. I simplify it for my clients as well as myself. Like if you give me a book that's like 400 to, to 700 pages long, I'm not going to look at it as a, like a problem. I'm looking at it as an opportunity to just sit down and enjoy it eat tea. Nice. That's excellent. No, that's an incredible journey. And everything from our past mentors have been just incredible for really elevating our journey and teaching us so much that we can then share that knowledge with others, which it seems like that's kind of what you focus on. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, they are worried about that self-accountability. They are uncomfortable with kind of being told what to do and what to do next and having that accountability. But it seems like you focus on okay, let's take the stress out of that situation. Let's calm down and I'm going to feed you the information in a way that you're going to comprehend, you're going to understand and then be able to take action without kind of feeling like I'm uncomfortable doing this. It seems like you take a different approach. Well, a lot of ways you always have to look at like, how does someone see something in their own reality? It could be one person I work with is uh, in real estate. He or she could be suffering from a form of impossible we can be is because they're being paid a lot more than they're accustomed to. And you feel like, well, should I have gone a degree? Should I have gone like all the laps that a lot of entrepreneurs didn't take? When you look at Mark Cuban, he may have been a college grad, but he said if he had to choose his route or path, he would have not gone to college. And the same goes for many other variations of people of entrepreneurship. But it's also a fixation on the education. Like Mark Sullenberg, he's incredibly intelligent. Though he did drop out of college, he did return to keep a promise to his mother that he would finish his education and show his children that it's an important of education, not the importance of the title that makes us into a better person. Mark Zuckerberg is one of those key texts, yes, as well as Elon Musk. Nothing holds him back. A title cannot hold any of us back. And I work with different people of different backgrounds because I try to make sure that they understand that I don't look at them any different. I see their strengths, not their weakness. And a lot of times with, with my clients, I try to remind them that when you start thinking that way, that's when you start failing. Absolutely. And just like you mentioned, the title isn't everything. It doesn't hold you back or take you anywhere. It's entirely true. It's really about the knowledge that's within us and how we apply it. And that can be so important, trying to invest back into ourselves. But what is the, the difference between selfishness and self-care? Is there a balance between like, okay, I'm comfortable investing in myself and it's worth it versus I'm only focusing on myself? Well, it's like the similarities to an adult or someone 
like you take care of yourself by like you go out and eat for instance like let's say you and me were eating we're in texas we're gonna eat texas barbecue so you can forget about eating what you go up there to call barbecue we're gonna eat breast we're gonna eat a lot of the fatty stuff but the other day chris you gotta hold, you have to hold me accountable because we have to go either to a crossfit gym or go work out because we have to burn off those calories that's accountability of health that is comfort food at our decision comfort food can be a very huge confusion to some of us. We could say, well, I go to McDonald's that filled me up. Did it? Because when you look at the percentages of how much is in certain processed food, is it healthy for you to say that that was comfort food or was that just a filler? And though we all have like a perception of like how we invest in ourselves, indulging in ourselves is kind of like a slippery slope. You buy a few things today, you buy more things tomorrow. You end up being on certain website that offer you sweet deals, but let's be honest, sweet deals come and go and straight to the trash can because you're treating yourself out of quality products as well as quality service. If you're a person that believes that you don't deserve to get self-care, I have to let you know right now, you deserve it. You're covering deserve. As an entrepreneur, you have to lead the charge. You have to lead by itself. If you can't feel like your function, like you're like in the verge of like saying I'm lazy, you could be in the verge of actually being burned out. And that's one of the key problems that people have a perception of selfish is self-care. self No, self-care and selfish are two separate things. To be selfish is like you're not even aware that you're selfish until someone actually tells you, you know, you really do a lot of things that hurt my feelings or you do a lot of things that really fight cool. Like whenever like, my turn to go somewhere or go, we end up doing what you want. That's, you're unaware. So you're aware of the people around you and how they feel and how you try to take care of yourself. And a lot of times we feel like being selfish is, oh, I'm just thinking of myself. The fact that you're aware of it means that you're taking care of the people around you as well as yourself. Something that you mentioned about leading the charge, I think is really important. There's a lot of these leaders, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and business owners that lack self-confidence. They're really unsure of what direction to take, so they may need a little bit more clarity. And I think all of it kind of gets wrapped into that burnout that you mentioned. They are kind of struggling just to stay afloat here when really they should then invest in themselves to find some work-life balance because you can't be your best unless you're fully recharged. If you're only running on a 20% you know, output ratio of your fuel tank isn't full, well, you're going to burn out pretty quickly. You're not going to have as much output. So it's important to have that self-care. But I think a lot of CEOs and entrepreneurs have misunderstandings of what self-care actually is. Are, are there any tips and tricks you can share or maybe what the misunderstandings are first and how we can overcome them? Well, I did throw in a lot of like theory. I could just share a story. It's a story that told to a lot of salaried men in Penn whenever the year in the verge of burning out. One person is an engineer. The other person is an electrician. They both graduate at the same time from their trade, from their skills to the university. And one gets paid almost X amount of money. The other one gets paid foolishly amount of cash. But he gets to choose his time the same with the engineer. They both get to choose their schedule, get to choose how they perceive their week. They can choose to leave early, choose to stay home. They can choose to work the way they want to work. But one person will proceed as like, oh, I have to work because I have to pay the bills. I have to do this. I have to do this. But I have to do this. We forget we can delegate and delegate and they're a team. If you're an entrepreneur, you have to remember the one key choice that you choose to trust people, but trust them to work the way you want them to work, the way you train them. If you didn't train them, train them now. So that way you don't have those problems. The problem with the engineer was that he kept on trying to make excuses about, like, I have to be the only one. I have to be the only one. I have to be the only one. The electrician's like, all right, here's the paperwork, here's the procedures. Leave it to the next person to do. He's not leaving his work for someone else. He's leaving it on a procedure of choice that leads to team work building. Like, the way it works in Japan, it, everything is structured to the next link, like a link of a chain. The chain can be broken, but the chain can be reforged and re -put and, and that is something that a lot of entrepreneurs have to remember. 
when you establish a well-trained team, you can easily just leave early. You can easily choose what days you work out per month. You can't just leave for a couple of months. Don't get me wrong. That would be fantastic. But let's be honest, it could be catastrophic for your team. It's only good for like a good period of time to relax. Now, if it was to network or make partnerships or make a thing that be gone for, you can rely on your team. But if you're constantly like questioning, like verge of burning out, you need to start delegating. Like if you have friends and family that are working with you and they're driving you insane, maybe you should set them aside and talk to them. Mm -hmm. You might not drive me insane today. It just like calm it down a bit. You hate to say it, but it's coming out of like, I want this business to succeed. I don't want it to fail. Absolutely. I think throughout the stages of your entrepreneurship journey, it can be tough to want to let go and delegate to a team or even to start to build a team because it can be difficult to find people you trust. But when it comes down to your team and what you're building there, you need to be able to set and manage those expectations, create processes that are simple and easy to follow for them. And in addition, I do find that as much as we like to think we have the right answers and doing it this way is the best way, when you empower your team to make those decisions, you'll be quite surprised at what they can come up with, which can only help boost the team and the company as a whole and just helps expand us because uh, sometimes you hire a role for the attitude and sometimes you hire because they have a specialty or a skill that they bring to the table. Like I wouldn't tell an accountant how to do my accounting. I'll just trust that they'll do it. But you do have the team members that sometimes you need to provide more guidance to them. Especially now, like I think in your last podcast, you think it was two podcasts ago, the transit situation allows employees will stay, the one will go, the one will stay. And the ones that do stay, are they the best for the team? Are they putting everything in their effort? Or are they just getting by? So if you're not setting the standards of your self-care, like I'm taking care of myself, I'm taking care of my team. But if you're just taking care of your team and forgetting yourself, your team's going to like, okay, He's not going to take care of this. He's not going to take care of this. He's not going to take care of this. I had to rely on myself. And that becomes like a me, me, me mentality. But I would say that what you said is correct. If you're not, you have to be there, but you have to be hands off. You have to see how you're going to perform. Do you need more support? Do you need less support? Who are the key players that you can rely on? How can you know if you're constantly working and micromanaging? Oh, absolutely. And in today's workforce in 2024, there has been a shift between where the company, the business had all the power to say what they wanted and, and to make demands. And now it seems that the workforce is kind of fighting back and saying, we need more culture. We need more pay. We need things that you're not currently providing to us. So they're job hopping and finding different opportunities. But that at the end of the day is something that the business owner needs to be mindful of. Like you said, we're not to like, micromanage and be hands-on with everything trust the team let them do what they want yeah because when you make a flow of a team like circulation of flow work if you're just constantly like stop let's do this stop let's do this there's no flow it's like if there's like a project going on in texas it's a bullet training system a hundred cool high skin it's a bullet training system that wishes to be dallas to corpus christi and it's been going on for 33 years i know we could have already built it by that point. It took seven years to build the first bullet train in Japan, but it's taking 33 years just for the plan to get through. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that you have to look at every perspective. How will it affect one group? How will it affect the community? How will it affect one town? How will it affect city growth? I can tell you this right now. By just sitting down with like a few professors and retired Toyota group, these see benefits in tremendous, dramatic range. The fact that tech is now considering it kind of shows that program is only through the team itself as well as to grow. Because you look at Japan, Japan, me mega city, it's in the Guinness World Record, Tokyo is one of the most popular cities in the world, but it's not the most livable, profitable city, meaning that people that work there don't live there because each take a bullet train. They'll even take a four-hour trip from one part of Japan all the way back to Tokyo every day, which is ridiculous, I know, but 
at the same time, four hours is on the oh yeah, I'm, I'm asleep, but you know, I just set a timer, I'm awake. But that's how it works. It's a process of like, look at how much it would benefit it is from one city versus overpopulation. You see, like places like California or Austin or Dallas or anywhere other that has vast variety of cities. Having so many overpopulation is very costly. If you were to spread the equal growth of people at e-commerce, like if you're only having people work in that said city, the other cities and other towns will benefit dramatically. But back to what you were talking about, teams, even in government, there's going to be pushback. Even in teams, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to see the opportunities and the problems. So all the problems I also saw all the solutions and profitability of just putting one bullet train in Texas. And though it's going to take time. Again, I know it took 33 years, but it's going to still take more time. So it's all the, all the process. You still have kickback. You have the pushback of people themselves. And just like in companies, you got to be like thriving one week or losing the net. And it's all about how you treat your team. And the employee route of how many people are actually being hired, I have to state with the massive layoff, people will look at how many of the times that you have spent in one company as one of the crucial factors of either are you going to be hireable or not hireable. Because if you're not a team player, you're going to have a lot of issues. In some teams, like especially collaboration, if you work well with other people, they will be good reference. But if you were an entrepreneur that was very eager to get a lot of contracts but hurt a lot of people, in Texas, our slogan is, yeah, you don't forget. Yeah. And that goes for a lot of business. If you treat someone bad in one state, we'll overhear it, we'll hear about it, we look up a reference. Not just any other state will do that, but most other states are also wealthy. If you treat people well, you get the best service. If you get the worst people, like you still go to them. That's a choice that you're making. Chasing a dollar, not chasing a customer. Loyalty to a customer is a service, but it's not a servitude. Absolutely. Everything you mentioned from there being a well-defined flow and a process that takes you through everything so you can have more manageable growth. It can be tough within entrepreneurship because like you said, there's one week where everything's going really great. Maybe you made a lot of sales. Everything's humming along great. The next week could be the worst week of your life. And you're like, wow, could this get any worse? And then it does. And just that inconsistency with the flow of how business goes can be a challenge. But for the entrepreneurs and business owners and CEOs that are out there, what are a few tips that they can work on themselves to help improve their self-care? Because I'm sure it all starts with the mindset. What's a, a tip or a practice they could go through throughout their day to help them improve? I would always do the 10-10 solution. It's a technique that's usually used in like places of Sydney, Australia for like business or real estate. What are the 10 benefits of the property or what are the 10 benefits of going to take care of yourself? And then what do you have to do? Basically, you have to write 10 reasons why and 10 reasons what the benefits are and 10 reasons why you should. It's like in relationships, like what do I want in the perfect partner? I want her to be beautiful. I want her to be smart. I want her to be intelligent. I want her to do all, like you say all these things, but then right back, what will you give back? Loyalty, care, love, so on and so forth. But the same goes in the company. What are you giving to your employees and what are you wanting in return? It's simple, it's changed, but just how you make the 10 10. If you're just questioning, why do I need you? I'm fine. If you're fine, then do a check. A simple check would be a health violation. And a simple check A simple go to psychiatrist, or therapist, or counselor, or coach. Get all the noise out of your system. You know, like problems that are building up because of the work. Try to get it off your chest. Don't vent. Though venting means well, venting is only if you're going to do something about it. If you're just like holding it in, never going to move forward. You're going to keep on. And I always recommend, if you're going to do a check, also do a, a physical check, a wellness check for your body and back. Because you'd be surprised. Simple trip to the chiropractor, all those, like, that weight, all that stuff, you think you're like, oh, it's just depression or, oh, it's anxiety. But maybe it's just, like, 
this time your whole physical body needs an adjustment. Or maybe you need to make a trip to uh, a session of yoga or to the gym. Absolutely. All of those things are great tips and things we need to be mindful of as we're kind of looking inward on ourselves and finding ways to improve our, our daily habits, our, our work-life balance, our physical, mental health. All of that plays a role. Now, Jesse, we only have a little bit of time left. I'm going to share some links for them to get in touch with Jesse and his team here at KMC. Uh, you can connect with him on LinkedIn, and I'm sure we'll have the website and other coach links available down in the show notes and description there. Jesse, what are you looking forward to most in 2024 here? Do you have any goals or aspirations that you're trying to achieve? My aspiration that goal that you're just about to Japan with friends and colleagues and expand my goal further, as well as do some carpentry this summer. Uh, I know it's going to be high in Texas, but I owe it to my mentor, Dave Larkin. He was a big inspiration to this path of my self-discovery and self-care. If it weren't for him, I just owe it to him just to also keep him make sure that he doesn't lose a toe or a finger or such. Because, yeah, he's uh, he's reaching his 70s. I just want to make sure he keeps all his fingers to 10. That's I, how I keep myself. I love it. That's fantastic. Well, I'm so excited for your future travel plans and business expansion. It's a lot of fun throughout the journey. We got to remember it's not a sprint, but a marathon. So make sure you take care of yourself and the others around you. So that way you can start having positive impacts on your own life and others. Jesse, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Congratulations on all of your past success and your future success as you go through the journey of entrepreneurship. And I just want to give a big, huge shout out to Chris. Thank you, Chris, for inviting me. I really appreciate this. Absolutely. Always our pleasure. Thank you so much.